Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Half Moon Church of Christ video service number 10 on Sunday, May 24th, Memorial Weekend. Hope you're all enjoying your weekend and uh, looking forward to June 7th when we will have socially distanced worship here in the building. That is the plan. As we begin our service this morning, would you join with me as we go to our Father in prayer at this time? Our Father in heaven, we give all praise, all honor, all glory to you. For truly, Father, you are great, you are glorious, you are all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent. We know, Father, that you're looking down upon each and every one of us, that you care for us, you love us, you created all of this for us. And even though now, Father, at this time, we may be going through a challenging time with this COVID, we do know that you still are looking out for us and that you have a plan. And whatever that plan is, Father, we have trust and faith in you that at the end, all things will turn out to your good. We pray, Father, that as we worship today, that we will focus our hearts and minds upon you and upon the word that is going to be delivered. It is so good, Father, that we can join even with this new technology together as one spirit to, to hear your word. We pray, Father, that you would be with all those that are, that are working on the front lines, that are uh, dealing with those who are sick. We pray that you would be with them, keep them safe, give them the tools and the experience and the knowledge that they need, Father, to protect those that are, that are ill and coming down with this, uh, this, inter this disastrous disease. Father, as we uh, go about this uh, week, we pray that you would be with us, watch over us, guide us, protect us, that we would do your will in all things. For we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. This is the Lord's Supper. The truth will set you free, and that will be the topic for the Lord's Supper this morning. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, 
You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's in John 8, 31 and 32. So let's briefly look at what is truth. Well, there is factual truth, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. The truth that conforms to reality, like one season follows the next. We can also speak of a true friend or true love. But what was the truth Jesus was speaking about when he said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free? On the day Jesus was crucified, while being questioned by Pilate, Jesus said, and I quote, in fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That's from John 18, 37. Pilate responded, what is truth? Whether Pilate was asking a genuine question or just brushing it off really is not clear. But, but regardless, Pilate did not know the answer and he missed out on the opportunity to find it. Jesus described himself by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. In John's letters, he frequently refers to belonging to or walking in the truth. He tells us that the Spirit is the truth. Paul in Ephesians says that the message of truth is nothing less than the gospel of our salvation. Well, that all sounds great, but it's still rather abstract. What we want to know is the reality of biblical truth. Will that help us with the day-to-day -day stuff of life? Well, the answer to that is yes, and it's right here at the foot of the cross. The truth of the cross is that God himself offered salvation by sending his son Jesus to die on a cross as an atonement for our sins. This atonement, a free, unmerited, undeserved gift, provides each of us a path to eternal salvation. Receiving this gift is wholly dependent on you. It is only through the complete work of the cross, from the crucifixion through the resurrection, that we are saved from eternal damnation and separation from God. Armed with this knowledge, our new attitude can go from discouragement to hope by sorting out the lies and the clutter and discovering God's truth. And that truth will set you free. I'll offer a prayer for the emblems. You may pause the video. After that, take communion with your family. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your great eternal plan of salvation for us. We thank you for sending Jesus to this earth to teach, to preach, and to ultimately die for our sins, to be resurrected from the grave. Father, we are just so grateful that your, your love for us is equally eternal. Bless us now, Father, as we take these emblems representing the broken body of Christ and his shed blood. In his holy name we pray, amen.
Good morning, and a bright and cheery morning it is, eh? Um, so, at uh, Camp Manitani last summer, we, uh, we talked about facing your giants and what that means and how everyone has their own giants. And a giant is something that stands in between you and what God wants for you. And so, I got a book the, at, the, at the end of the week of camp that's called Goliath Must Fall. Um, and it talks about all of the uh, things that stand in your way between you and God. And although these giants may seem large and ferocious, um, we have something uh, much more fierce as our weapon, and that's, that's the Lord. And in, in the book, uh, the author, uh, Giglio, he writes, if we truly want to change, then we need to understand our dependency on the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to be reading from 1 Samuel 17, and that's uh, about the story of Goliath. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span, which is about six six feet and nine inches, so just a little bit taller than me. And continuing on, he says, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels, which is about 125 pounds, and it was predicted that he weighed about 600 pounds, so he is the equivalent weight of a water buffalo. Continuing on, it said, on his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like, a, was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. So, um, using all this information, we can tell that Goliath, he was a rather large person, and he was equipped in the ways of war to do things that the people of Israel were seemed incapable of defending themselves against, except for David, who, uh, who had his faith in God, and as God says, he is a man after, David was a man after God's own heart. So, and that shows that David, using his faith in God, his weapon may have been uh, his slingshot and those stones, but the things that carry the stones was God's will and God's power. And finally, I'm just going to read a quote that was pretty uh, awesome at camp. And it says, don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell your storm how big your God is. Thanks, Ben. That was uh, pretty awesome. Um, so this is a unique experience for me. But it's fun because uh, the same things that you would <clears throat> envision happening when we're all together still happen. Jim was walking around whispering in everyone's ear as we were recording little things that he wanted to say, just like as if we were all here together. So um, as most of the times in the past, I'm going to choose a single word that's going to be the focal point for the discussion today and the lesson that's presented, and that word is diligence. Diligence. Diligence is, is defined as careful and persistent work or effort. So as our lesson begins, and I didn't give you guys here a warning either, I want you to grab a pen and a piece of paper. And that'll be for later. Or you can use your phone and just text it to yourself or something like that. Take a note. But, you know, just think about that as you write something down. As, you, as you're writing something down, I think about how diligent those scribes and monks must have been when they were just having to rewrite things and rewrite things and rewrite things. And it reminds me of a joke. A novice monk is copying text at a monastery, and he's diligently working as he's writing these things down, and he's thinking, hmm, if I just copy my master's work, and he just copied his master's work, and his, mas his master just copied from his master, and so on and so on. What if there was a mistake? Wouldn't the mistake just be propagated with each new 
apprentice. Finally, his thoughts got to be so much that he went to the abbot of the, of the monastery. After he told the abbot what he thought, the abbot says, wow, that's quite a weight on your mind. Let me check the archive so I can prove that there are no mistakes. The monk doesn't see the abbot again for several hours, but when he does, the abbot rushes out and he says, oh, we've made a horrible mistake. What is it, replied the young apprentice monk. There's a word change. It's supposed to say celebrate. <laughs> Can say that in this company. Ben is looking there like, I don't get it. <laughs> so it's perfect. So let's get into the lesson. There are two verses that I was debating on choosing this morning for the word diligence. The first one was, keep your heart with all vigilance. Close enough to, to diligence. For from it flow the springs of life to be diligent. When you keep your heart diligent. Put away from, your, put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So that was one of the passages that I was going to look at. But here's the one that I chose. Because it reminds me of my mom. And the way that she loved reading Proverbs, and this was one that she even talked to me about. Go to the ant you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food for, at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come to you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Not a whole lot of mincing of words there. Pretty much tells you to get up and be diligent and do the right thing. Do the right thing. You know, I'm given chores all the time at my house. And now I guess during this time, probably more than other times, just finished painting my second room yesterday. And I like to paint. Painting, you have to be diligent at. You have to be diligent. Not just in the while you're painting, but in the preparation. Think about all that had to go on here while we painted this facility. While we painted this building, the preparation that had to take place. Steve last week was talking about the, the artwork around the world. You think those guys were diligent and when they were preparing and what it is that they were getting ready to paint? And I never liked doing chores as a younger guy. I just was, you know, I wanted to sleep in and I didn't have Xbox or anything, but uh, I had a Sega Genesis and a Nintendo. I guess it's the same thing. But when you, as I've gotten older and I've heard the phrase time and time again, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. I'm starting to feel that way at my own house. So I'm starting to do more and more of my own chores that I never like to do. But I, I like them done in a particular way, and I like them to be done correctly. And God gives us these instructions because he wants things done in a particular way, and he wants them done correctly. Especially when it comes to matters of our heart and where we are at. So, is diligence one of your traits? Are you a diligent person? Is there something that you are diligent at, that you do diligently? That's what I want you to write down or text to yourself. The thing that you think about when you think about, man, I am diligent when I do this one thing. I want you to write it down. And... Now I want you to consider this question as you look at your word. Are you diligent towards God 
and your faith in God and your work for God in the same way that you are diligent in the word that you just wrote down. We can use Proverbs 4.23 as the basis, really, of the lesson, too, if we wanted to. The springs of life. Um, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Springs of life, that sounds pretty good. What are the springs of life? And do you even want them? What are the springs of life, and do you want them? I read this commentary by a guy named Benson. I don't know who he is. <clears throat> Above all, keeping, keep thy heart, that is, thy mind and thoughts, thy will and affections, which are the more immediate cause of men's actions. Out of it are the issues of life. The life, of death, the life or death of the soul proceeds from the heart. An upright, enlightened, renewed, devout, and watchful heart gives birth to those holy dispositions, words, and actions which manifest spiritual life and lead to eternal life. On the contrary, a heart insincere, unenlightened, unrenewed, and corrupt, without knowledge, without grace, produces those tempers, words, and works which imply spiritual death and lead to eternal death. From the heart proceeds all evil, it tells us in Matthew 11, 15, 11 through 19. Guard it, therefore, most carefully, with every kind of diligence and above all other cares. Isn't that why we are here or why we're watching this video and sitting on your couch or your recliner or as us guys gathered here today so that we can be together with God for eternity? We want to be diligent in our work for God because we want to be with him. And thinking about being with him for eternity makes me want to be more diligent in the things that I'm doing. I'm going to close with one more passage, and then I'll be done. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13 through 25. So it's a longer reading, so bear with me. And if you indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve, with, serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, that you might gather your grain and your wine and your oil. He will give you grass in your fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. The anger, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens, so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good of the land the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them on as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, taking of, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your forefather, to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, and holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will, uh, dispos and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear, will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread, as he promised you. And then that's all I have to, <clears throat> to bring forward today. And um, I'm sure it'll be mentioned later, but if you have any concerns or needs or there's a time in which you want to Pray with someone even over the phone or 
get together and social distance, I'm sure that uh, one of the elders or even the deacons would be willing to meet with you and talk with you. And um, thank you for your time. Pray that our services this morning was uplifting and glorifying to God. That's our purpose for coming together, uh, spiritually anyway, as if not physically this morning. And we pray that God receives our worship in the manner that's being offered. We want to remind everyone that in two weeks, May 7th, we will have some service here at the uh, building. And this week, uh, this Wednesday, maybe we can get a little poll to see uh, how many people are thinking of attending that just so that we know what type of numbers we were to be expecting. Uh, keep uh, in, your, in your prayers Thomas Hill of uh, Thomas Timothy Hill Ranch, uh, who has pancreatic cancer, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, keep Eileen's parents in your prayers also, and uh, Eileen as she's taking care of them. Uh, also keep Carol, Norm's sister, in your prayers. Uh, she's uh, having some uh, issues uh, physically and, that, uh, that, and emotionally, I think. So keep her in your prayers. And Melissa, Gail's daughter with her thyroid cancer, and her surgery is due in July, so keep her in your prayers. And I want to thank everyone for praying uh, in regard to Courtney. Uh, she is feeling much better now, and actually this morning she did go out for a little run, so she is doing well there. Thank God for that. And also Clay Graham, um, uh, Bodix have asked that uh, we pray for him, uh, and he is in therapy. 
Uh, also, uh, uh, Jack, uh, Jim and Mary's brother-in-law, the husband of Betty, keep him in your prayers. He has low b blood count, and uh, the, I guess the uh, doctors are trying to figure out what's going on with him. So, please uh, participate on Wednesday night if you can. Uh, we've had some pretty good turnout there with our uh, um, Zoom classes, and it's been a good time of getting together and talking and saying hello to people. Uh, that's been very successful. So, if you can, if you haven't participated in, in that on Wednesday night, uh, please do so, and you, I think you'll find it enjoyable. Please pray with me as we close out this service. Father, we're so grateful for this time that we can mold our hearts and minds together and that we may open it up to glorify you this morning. Help us, Father, to always look to you and your word for guidance in our lives and that we indeed may grow closer to you in our walk here on earth, that we may approach the gate and of heaven, Father, that along that narrow road, help us to look and to um, be able to walk that narrow path to that gate. Help us to persevere, Father, as we talked about uh, Wednesday night. Help us to always look to you uh, for guidance. Watch over all these people that we've uh, talked about tonight and today in these um, on the, our prayer lists and have your hand over them. We know, Father, that if it is your will that they will indeed be brought to a better state of health. We're so grateful for this time. We're grateful for our family uh, and our, our family of God that we uh, worship with and we pray that you watch over all of us uh, and help us to be able to come together uh, quickly and, and watch over those uh, that are assisting us in this pandemic, all the first responders and uh, the police, the fire people, the, the medical EMTs, and all those people, Father, that are um, um, trying to help our country to get past this. And bless those that are trying to um, get uh, the proper medicines and that we indeed may be able to put this behind us and be able to go about our lives normally. Father, help this to uh, be able to bring people to you. Help this pandemic to make people realize the brevity of this life on earth, and that they need you most of all. Be with us as we continue in your service. In Jesus' name, amen.